Welcome to the AC 24-7 Top Story Countdown. We'll guide you through the biggest news of the day. Our focus, advocating our rights, advocating equality, advocating health, and advocating Earth. Here's our pick for number four. Two years ago, it was hard to imagine 15-year-old Johnny Lubin doing this for very long. Born with sickle cell disease, an inherited disorder affecting the red blood cells, Johnny has been in and out of the hospital his entire life, dealing with bouts of extreme pain and other serious complications. It was kind of hard for me to like do things like have fun and stuff because I'd always have to be worried about if I'd have a pain crisis or not. It would mostly be in my back, like my lower back, and it'd always like be like really like a pounding pain in my back, so it hurt a lot. How long would they last? Sometimes the days. Until now, the only hope for a cure for the estimated 100,000 people in the U.S. with the disease has been a bone marrow transplant. But like more than 80% of patients with sickle cell, Johnny couldn't find a donor. We were desperate. Mm -hmm. At that point, we were like, okay, what's going to be next? We thought that we were going to lose them. So Johnny and his family decided to try something that's almost never been done before. I was worrying that I might be like get like superpowers or something. <laughs> like. As part of a clinical trial for a completely new kind of treatment, Johnny is now one of the first people in the world to have his genes edited using CRISPR to treat his disease. And I'm like, wow, that's that's pretty cool. <laughs> and scary. And yeah, and freaky. Do you feel like a medical pioneer? I don't know. I feel like I feel like a guinea pig. <laughs> <laughs> in sickle cell, a genetic mutation causes red blood cells, which carry oxygen around the body, to be misshapen, like crescents or sickles. They can get stuck in the blood vessels, causing severe pain and decreased oxygen to organs. CRISPR allows you to make a precise cut in DNA. In this case, cells are removed from the body and edited to turn on production of a different form of the oxygen-carrying protein hemoglobin, a type we have when we're babies, explains Johnny's doctor, Monica Batia. Then the edited cells are returned to the patient. So in essence, it's a fetal hemoglobin induction um, process. And that's good enough? Fetal hemoglobin we know has oxygen, um, a higher oxygen carrying capacity than adult hemoglobin or sickle hemoglobin. And so yes, it is more than good enough. <laughs> <laughs> and so far, it has been good enough. 29 out of 30 patients, including Johnny, met the trial's goal, being free from having a pain crisis for at least a year after treatment. How long has it been? Two years. Two years. Now Johnny and his family celebrate his treatment day as his second birthday. October 4th is when I got the infusion. So basically I got the whole new like dose of like cells and stuff. And while Johnny didn't turn into a superhero, what he got might be even better. I'm starting to teach him how to drive, so that's another, <laughs> you know, thing to worry about. So, yeah, so we're stepping into the regular worrisome of, you know, raising a teenager. The chance to be a regular kid. He's a clown. My baby's a clown. Yes, I am. TheAdvocateChannel.com looks at the world through the lens of equality and inclusion. Subscribe, like, and share now. AC 24-7's Top Story Countdown continues with our producer's pick for number three. We are extremely outraged. Anger and disappointment from the NAACP directed at the Biden administration for slow walking a ban on menthol flavored cigarettes. For decades, tobacco companies have aggressively targeted minority communities with marketing, and it's been effective. More than 83% of black smokers choose menthols, and black people die at significantly higher rates of smoking-related illnesses. If you don't ban menthol flavor, you send in a clear message that black lives do not matter. It raised a real question. Is this a discriminatory act by this administration to neglect the health concerns of the African-American community. But the African-American community is divided on the issue. Government schedules show on November 20th, top administration officials met with prominent black leaders and representatives, including an executive with Al Sharpton's National Action Network. Also present were tobacco industry stakeholders and lobbyists, including former North Carolina Congressman G.K. Butterfield, now a tobacco industry lobbyist. All opposed the ban, saying it would lead to an illicit market and more deadly police encounters, like Eric Garner, who was killed at the hands of New York City police for allegedly selling loose cigarettes. It's becoming a political issue because of, of black leaders 
uh, trying to make it such. You know, you have black leaders that are taking the stand of tobacco companies rather than saving black lives. A ban would only allow the FDA to regulate the sale and distribution of menthol cigarettes. That means the enforcement would focus on retailers, manufacturers, and distributors, not individuals. In an election cycle, conservative groups have seized the opportunity to capitalize on the issue. Biden's priority is banning menthol cigarettes. Zeroing in on a potential political liability for Biden. Their strategy includes more ads like this one. Republican Senator Tom Cotton tweeting, Joe Biden wants to ban menthol cigarettes which are favored by black smokers. Meanwhile, he wants to legalize weed for white college kids. Public health groups say the Biden administration is putting politics over people. There's just no reason for this delay, and only one can conclude cynically that the industry has had an influence on the administration's decision. Like the Advocate channel on Facebook for the best way to get updated stories that advocate for equality, justice, our rights, and more. AC 24-7 continues with today's top two pick. Uh a deal that would provide about $60 billion worth of support toward Ukraine's war against Russia is in a stalemate blocked this week by Senate Republicans. We are not in a position to make that promise to, to Ukraine, given where things are on the hill. The aid package also includes funds for Israel, Taiwan, and U.S. border security measures. That's where the GOP is standing firm. They are going to have to grant significant concessions on the border to pass the president's supplemental uh, aid package. And, and certainly the House of Representatives will demand that. And, and until they accept that reality, the legislation will not pass. President Joe Biden says he's ready to talk with Republicans on the issue. I am willing to make significant compromises on the border. We need to fix the broken border system. It is broken. And thus far, I've gotten no response. Sources tell CNN President Biden is willing to raise the credible fear standard for migrants, which could make less migrants eligible for asylum. He's chosen to let people loose in the country. He's chosen to abuse the parole law, and his choice has led to a broken border with elevated terrorist threats. Joe Biden has been asleep at the wheel when it comes to the border. You need to wake up, Mr. President, before we get hit. I'm John Lawrence reporting. Follow The Advocate channel on Twitter and Instagram to stay updated on stories that matter every day. We're now at our number one story of the day. Take a look. This video was shown in Tuesday's committee hearing about campus anti-Semitism, showing demonstrations at Harvard, MIT, and the University of Pennsylvania whose presidents testified they condemn anti-Semitism. UPenn's presidents said safety and freedom of expression both need to exist for democracy to thrive. These competing principles can be difficult to balance, but I am determined to get it right. Critics say she and her colleagues got a key question wrong. I am asking, specifically calling for the genocide of Jews, does that constitute bullying or harassment? If it is directed and severe or pervasive, it is harassment. So the answer is yes. It is a context-dependent decision. It should not be hard to condemn genocide. Pennsylvania's governor urged the university's board of trustees to meet. They did Thursday, although it's not immediately clear what they discussed. Just hours before the House committee announced an investigation with full subpoena power into all three universities, saying they would hold these schools accountable for their failure on the global stage. Wednesday, President McGill issued a clarification. I was not focused on, but I should have been. The irrefutable fact that a call for genocide of Jewish people is a call for some of the most terrible violence human beings can perpetrate. She and the school reiterated she will get it right, even as critics say she should not get that chance. Thanks for watching The Advocate Channel's top stories. We're on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and YouTube. Follow, like, and share, or check out advocatechannel.com for even more stories that advocate for you.